So our next speaker is uh, Peter Lakatos uh, from the uh, Nathan Klein Institute in Orangeburg, um, who will talk about dynamics and function of neural oscillatory entrainment in the auditory system. So first of all, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. <coughs> I think it's going to be a great uh, uh, conference, and I hope I can uh, contribute to it. So as David already said, as you, and as you all know, neuronal oscillations are a prominent feature of electrophysiological recordings on all levels. Um, and they reflect that one of the major operational modes in the brain is rhythmic. Now, since uh, most auditory stimuli um, that we encounter are also rhythmic, it seems that the brain and these, uh, the acoustic environment are a pretty good match if the brain has mechanisms to align its internal excitability fluctuations um, signaled by neuronal oscillations to the timing of these uh, relevant auditory stimuli. So these mechanisms will be um, what I will talk about most in the primary auditory cortex of macaque monkeys. So in the first part of the talk, I will briefly describe the recording technique we use in the lab, and next I'm going to talk about the structure and modulation of ongoing neuronal ensemble activity, and the role of oscillatory entrainment in auditory selective attention. And in the second half of the talk, I will uh, try to talk about why is this all relevant to speech perception, since this is why we are here. Um, so the recording technique. On each experimental day, we lower one or two of these uh, linear array multi-electrodes into auditory cortical areas or uh, thalamic regions. And uh, we position the electrodes based on auditory responses to broadband noise bursts. Here you can see the field potential response profiles. Here is the multi-unit activity response profile. And from the field potentials, to get rid of the effects of volume conduction, we calculate one-dimensional current source density profiles uh, offline. Now, these CSD profiles can be used here. You just see the color-coded version of the traces on the left. These CSD profiles can be used to then reliably determine the boundaries of the supragranular, granular, and infragranular layers uh, in our cortical recordings. Now, negative CSD values are called sinks, and they are typical of initial excitatory uh, postsynaptic potentials. Positive CSD values are sources, and they signal net outward uh, transmembrane current. Now, besides auditory evoked responses that you see here, even ongoing neuronal activity has a nice laminar profile, and this is what I'm going to talk about next. So as you can see on this three-second long CSD segment, here is laminar depth, here is time, ongoing neuronal activity is largest in amplitude in the supragranular layers, and this is what's shown in the pool data uh, to the left. Now, this is obviously not a simple sinusoidal oscillation, but if I overlay the delta band filtered waveform, you can indeed see rhythmic reoccurrences of these stronger sync source pairs in the supragranular layers with some higher frequency oscillations uh, superimposed on it. Now, if you look at the typical spectrogram of the supragranular, this is very important that this is characteristic of the supragranular layers, you mostly see a delta, a theta, and a gamma uh, frequency peak. Um, now, what do they, these oscillations do? On a basic level, since they reflect membrane potential fluctuations of the local neuronal ensemble, they, they have to be connected to excitability, so they cause um, fluctuation of the spontaneous firing of the same local neuronal ensemble. So uh, if we want to see which phase of these oscillations, but yeah, first of all, if you look at the multi-unit activity spectrum, you can see that you can see peaks that correspond to peaks in the CSD spectrum, meaning that the dominant oscillations in the current source density uh, spectrum actually do modulate multi-unit activity. Now, if you want to know which phase of these oscillations is sort of the high excitability phase versus the low, low excitability phase, because there always have to be uh, these uh, opposite phases in oscillations. We can look at uh, uh, CSD phase-triggered multi-unit activity. And as you can see, for all of these oscillations, multi-unit activity is minimal around the positive peak of the oscillatory activity, which we call the, the low excitability phase. And multi-unit activity is maximal just prior to around the negative peak of each of these oscillations, which is the high excitability phase for supragranular oscillations. Of course, it depends on where you uh, measure these. 
Now, there is an, as, as David already alluded to it, there is an intricate relationship between these um, different frequency oscillations in that if I overlay the amplitude envelope of the high frequency oscillations on the oscillations themselves, and then move it up to the lower frequency oscillations, you can see whenever delta is in its high excitability phase, theta amplitude is up, same is true for the theta gamma relationship. So the phase of the lower frequency oscillations modulates amplitude of the higher frequency oscillatory activity. You can quantify this by calculating the coherence between oscillations, low frequency oscillations, which are on the y axis, and high frequency oscillatory amplitudes, which is on the x axis. And you can see that there is strong uh, coherence in the intersection of delta theta, theta gamma, and delta gamma oscillations. So all low-frequency oscillations modulate the amplitude of higher-frequency oscillatory activity. And a simple way to think about it is that whenever delta is in its low excitability phase, all other oscillations pretty much are stopped. Like, you don't see any uh, delta or theta oscillatory activity in those pauses. Um, so this is one of the reasons why uh, oscillations are implicated in speech processing, since speech has a similarly uh, organized uh, hierarchical structure. Now, another um, uh, reason why uh, oscillations are implicated in speech processing is that these oscillations can be actually aligned to the timing of uh, specific speech elements via oscillatory phase reset. And to illustrate phase reset here, I'm showing you single trials that were recorded in primary auditory cortex uh, of the macaque monkey. And as you can see, before any stimulus, these are completely random across trials. But after a resetting event, they become aligned to the timing of this stimulus across trials, so that for one or two cycles, they are in phase. This is why they show up in the average. Now, if you present stimuli rhythmically, and thereby you basically uh, do rhythmic phase reset, what, what happens is you actually entrain these ongoing oscillations in that you modulate their wavelength and phase to align to the temporal structure of the presented stimuli, especially uh, in cases when these are attended. And as a consequence, because of phase amplitude coupling, if you align the low frequency oscillation, you also align all uh, other high frequency oscillatory amplitudes to the timing of relevant events. So in the study I'm going to talk uh, to you about next, we were actually curious how this oscillatory entrainment occurs in primary auditory cortex. This is space. Uh, this actually signals differently tuned neuronal ensembles that are organized topographically across A1. So how are oscillations entrained in time across these different neuronal ensembles? One possibility is that all of them all neuronal ensembles will be entrained to their high excitability phases, which would uh, basically just be a temporal filter. So any acoustic information that comes at predicted or uh, attended time points would be amplified. Now, a stronger filter mechanism would emerge if only the region that processes the attended frequency content would be entrained to its high excitability phase. So for example, if you're listening to four kilohertz tones, only the four kilohertz region would be entrained to its high excitability phase. This would, uh, only, this would amplify specific events in frequency and time. So this would be a two-dimensional filter mechanism. And an even stronger mechanism would emerge if uh, the region processing attended frequency content would entrain to its high, while surrounding regions would entrain to their low excitability phases. And to examine these possibilities, we uh, basically presented rhythmic auditory and visual stimulus streams uh, simultaneously. And uh, they, they, these stimulus streams differed in their stimulus onset asynchrony. And the visual stimulus stream was always the same across all trial blocks. It was LED flashes, green LED flashes, uh, with randomly occurring deviants that differed in their intensity. Now, the auditory streams uh, varied from trial block to trial block in their frequency within the monkey's hearing range. We had 14 different frequencies. <coughs> and uh, the animals um, basically had to detect frequency deviants when they were instructed to attend to the auditory stream. And our two main conditions were we told the monkey either to attend to the auditory stimuli or to attend to the visual. 
So here are uh, auditory multi-unit activity responses to different frequency tone streams. The frequency of tone streams is on the uh, x-axis, and multi-unit activity amplitude is on the y. So here are the multi-unit activity responses. As you can see, the largest response uh, occurs in the case of 4 kilohertz tones. So this specific site was tuned to 4 kilohertz. Here's the tuning curve that we created from the MUA responses. And these are responses to ignored tone streams. So the monkey was attending to actually visual stimuli and detecting visual deviants. Now, if I overlay the case where the monkey was actually attending to the tones, what you can see is that we get a significant amplification at the best frequency if, attended, uh, if the monkey was attending to the frequency that matched the uh, tuning properties of this site. And in all other cases, you get suppression. So basically, the, the, the effect of attending to pure tones is a sharpening of frequency tuning around the attended uh, frequency. Now, the same is true in the pool data. And next, we looked at uh, whether this could be due to oppositely entrained delta oscillations. And uh, basically, the histograms uh, here show delta oscillatory phases at the timing of attended auditory tones for different frequencies. And what you can see is that in the case when attended frequency matched the best frequency, the tuning properties of the recording site, uh, delta, oscillation, delta oscillatory phases were biased towards the negative, while in all other cases they were biased towards the positive uh, peak. So um, basically this shows that delta oscillations are entrained uh, to the high excitability phase if uh, they match the tuning properties of the, the recording site, while if they don't, then they are in three opposite phases. And the attention effect comes from the fact that when the animals attend to visual stimuli, there is no delta phase bias. So delta oscillations in this case are actually entrained by visual stimuli. That's why you don't see anything for auditory stimuli. So if I color code uh, delta oscillatory phases to attended tones, you can see that only a limited um, set of uh, tones causes uh, high excitability, while most tones cause opposite phase low excitability entrainment when the animal is attending to pure tones. So to summarize um, the findings of this study, attention sharpens frequency tuning primary, in primary auditory cortex via the frequency-specific entrainment of ongoing delta oscillations. All of A1, this is important, all of A1 entrains to the temporal structure of attended stimuli, irrespective of their frequencies. So even a even a very narrow band, pure tone, is able to engage all of your uh, primary auditory cortex. And finally, A1 regions tuned to the frequency of attended sounds are entrained to their high, while others are entrained to their opposite low excitability phases. So now I come to the second half of the talk. Why is this all relevant to speech perception? So why should we care? Um, especially the, given that there are some problems with, with our most commonly used paradigms. And these problems, the first one is that most of the time we use perfectly regular isochronous uh, stimulation, like in the study uh, that I showed you before. A second problem is that we use very simplistic stimuli, like there is nothing more simplistic than a pure tone. And the third potential problem is that we are using the monkey to to um, potentially uh, suggest me mechanisms for speech processing, like how do we know that these mechanisms are actually in place in uh, non-human primates similar to humans? Now, in our defense, um, uh, basically the reason we use simplistic stimuli, uh, uh, we used simplistic stimuli in our experiment so far, is that we wanted to exclude any unknown variable. So we wanted to uh, go very basic. And one of these unknown uh, variables is uh, how much stimulus onset asynchrony variation can we allow before we lose the perception of uh, rhythm. And uh, we recently brainstormed with uh, Molly Henry and Jonas uh, Oblazer about this, like how, how do we define rhythm? What can be still called rhythmic despite some stimulus onset asynchrony variation? And uh, we came up with a few criteria, one of the most important uh, being that basically you can ask people, like, do, do, you, do you perceive this as rhythmic or do you think this is completely irregular stimulation? And this is what I'm going to try to do now, it might completely fail, but I'm going to ask you, 
please raise your hand only if you think that the stimulus sequence I'm presenting is completely random, so there is no detectable rhythm in it. And uh, I'm going to have to switch back and forth to stop the stimuli. This is regular stimulation, so isochronous. Oh, Nancy. This, this is completely regular, so uh, rhythmic. Now, the next one. Still no hands. Okay, and the last one. <laughs> Still no hands. It's amazing. <laughs> and actually, you're right. I will uh, show it to you uh, in, in the next slide. So here are the stimulus onset asynchrony distributions that you just heard. One of them was completely regular. The second one was 10% uh, stimulus onset asynchrony variation around the mean, meaning that from 450 to 550 milliseconds, then 20% and 30% stimulus onset asynchrony modulation. Like, that's huge, uh, the, the 30%. And uh, let me remind you that if you use a stimulation with like a 1,000 millisecond mean stimulus onset asynchrony, then 30% would be 700 to 1,300 milliseconds. So that's a huge range. Uh, so basically, you all felt. Yeah. It was the, the, the mean was uh, two hertz. Yes. Uh, yes, and your tolerance probably depends on the mean rate, which I won't go into. But <clears throat> so, besides perception, of course, we can design behavioral experiments to see if. Uh, uh, rhythmic uh, presentation has an adv uh, or creates an advantage, but we can also create models, and this is actually not a real model; it's a simulation of uh, oscillatory entrainment. So what you see here is uh, it's a 10-second long time interval. Time is on the x-axis, frequency is on the y-axis, and the instantaneous frequency of delta oscillation is the yellow trace. So before any stimulation occurs, it fluctuates as uh, normal ongoing oscillations do. And once uh, stimuli arrive, after the first stimulus pair, the frequency is adjusted to halfway between the ongoing frequency and the stimulation rate, so that after a few cycles, it gets very close to the repetition rate of the uh, stimuli. Now, here is the oscillation. You can see in the beginning there is just phase reset, and then uh, it quickly, quickly, quickly becomes uh, the oscillation frequency becomes equal to the, or almost equal to the rate of stimulation. Now, what we can do is we can actually measure uh, delta phases at the times of imaginary stimuli, and then we can we can present to this model different stimulus onset variab uh, variabilities. And what you can see here is that for zero variability, you get an ITC delta ITC close to one while for more variabilities, delta ITC declines, and actually around 35%, it gets below uh, significant. So if the brain um, is using an oscillation to, to um, kind of be predictive about the timing of up upcoming stimuli, at around 30%, no oscillation can be aligned, so oscillatory entrainment would fail. And we would probably perceive these stimuli as non-rhythmic. And uh, actually, these are the stimulus and asynchrony variations you heard. So we were still a little bit above the level of randomness here. So maybe that's why no one raised their hands. I was expecting a few hands, but... Um, so that's uh, one of the things. But this was, uh, remember, uniform... Uh, stimulus onset asynchrony variation distribution, which is actually unnatural. So in, in speech, you never have uniform SOA distributions. You have normal SOA distributions. So, so some stimulus onset asynchronies or time constants occur more frequently than others. And in this case, actually, entrainment, it's worth to entrain to this stimuli with even bigger uh, variation if our model is right. And to determine if the model is right, we actually have a project going with uh, Odette Gitza, uh, where we uh, present stimuli to the monkey with varying stimulus onset asynchronies. Uh, 
and we can measure actual intertrial coherence values. And what you can see is that uh, at first, all of our measured normalized intertrial coherence values for these variances, they do not seem to fit very well with the model. They are significantly different. However, if we actually adjust one of the model parameters, and this parameter is how much the ongoing oscillatory frequency is changed from repetition to repetition to 100%, meaning that the oscillatory frequency is adjusted immediately to the repetition rate after the first repetition, then we get a much better match. So maybe in the first uh, iteration of our model, we underestimated the brain because it actually is able to adjust on a repetition by repetition basis to the, to the repetition rate of external stimuli. So these are, one of, these are one of the directions we are taking. And other is changing from very simplistic stimuli to somewhat more complicated ones. And um, one of our favorite paradigms we actually borrowed from the lab of, of uh, Maria Chaic, where <clears throat> they present basically very uh, random, rep uh, very um, quickly repeating stimuli that have different frequency, totally random frequency um, and uh, noisiness content, uh, which we call a sound cloud. And then at random time intervals, 11 of the preceding tones are selected. Here's just the selection, and then repeated five times. And uh, amazingly, human observers actually detect these patterns, even, even if you don't pay attention to these, halfway through the first repetition. And I let you experience these. And they're really cool. <laughs> So it's amazing, it's, it, it's a totally random selection repetition, but you pick it up immediately. So the human brain is, must be tuned to detect these uh, repetitive patterns. And uh, basically, when we presented this to the monkey, we had two questions. Uh, the, of course, the, the most basic one is the monkey's brain able to detect these uh, similar to humans. And the second one, can the brain actually align some kind of oscillatory structure to these, despite no physical boundaries. So uh, I, I really like uh, when uh, Odette talks about acoustic-driven and, uh, and uh, context-driven uh, events in, in, in auditory processing. So this would be a completely context-driven uh, oscillatory alignment since there is no physical boundary for these patterns. And what we found is the answer for both is yes. Since if, when we measured uh, ITC at the delta frequency that corresponded to the repetition rate, we saw that it rised significantly, uh, rised above significance somewhere throughout the first repetition in primary auditory cortex, and it was maintained throughout. Same in the thalamus. Uh, you can see pulvinar in yellow and uh, MGB in, uh, in green. And what we also noted is that um, oscillatory entrainment occurred um, as indicated by ITC, occurred earlier in primary auditory cortex and pulvinar, meaning that it's likely not a bottom-up type acoustic-driven entrainment. It is via some top-down route that we are not, we don't know yet, but uh, it likely involves the pulvinar. Um, so basically, we know that the monkey's brain is able to detect these patterns, but how do we know that the monkey perceives them? And uh, of course, the monkeys weren't taught to detect these patterns, but what we did is we looked at um, the pupil diameter trace. So if, if you look at the phase of the pupil diameter trace, what you see is that it actually becomes aligned, the, these histograms become biased um, almost at the time of the first repetition. So if the monkey's pupil gets entrained by these patterns, we are pretty sure that the monkey actually consciously uh, perceives these uh, similar to humans. So now that we dealt with these questions, we can actually present uh, even more complex stimuli, uh, human speech, which we only recently started to do. In order to skip class without being detected, the school kids developed a rather devious ploy. And, and the main reason we started to present these speech stimuli is we were curious what parts 
of speech are responsible for, there is plenty of evidence that uh, oscillations are tracking speech, but what speech elements are responsible for aligning these oscillations to the speech? And we argued that we can use the monkey brain because we can actually go into auditory cortex and get a much closer look than, than what pe people can do in uh, most, human, uh, most humans. And uh, what we decided to do, since we realized that there is this sort of high frequency stream in speech, the, the fricative consonants, and a lower frequency stream. And we know very little about uh, speech, uh, so we, we just looked at the spectrogram and decided, OK, let's put one electrode in the high frequency region of uh, primary auditory cortex and the other in the low frequency region. And here are just the uh, sound amplitude envelopes for these, uh, that, that match these regions from the, the, the speech spectrum. And what you can see is that amazingly, well, not so amazingly, we weren't that surprised, but we were very happy that uh, the low and high frequency region, this is unfiltered CSD for the same uh, time as the speech signal. Um, what you can see even in this unfiltered CSD is that there are low frequency oscillations that, are, that become aligned to the speech. This is averaged uh, CSD. And they are opposite in phase in high and low frequency regions. So basically, what we think happens, speech has um, basically uh, high and low frequency elements ar arranged pretty regularly. So if you can see, it's low, high, low, high, low, high. Y you know this uh, better than I do. So what we think happens is that both high and low frequency elements reset primary auditory cortex in their own region to high, in the opposite region to low excitability phases. And therefore, for example, when this speech element resets the, the uh, low frequency region to low excitability phase, it prepares it for the upcoming low frequency speech element because by the time that arrives, your oscillation will be actually in the high excitability phase. You can actually really nicely see it here. So this guy resets this oscillation to the low excitability phase, prepares it, it, it the oscillation oscillates as they do, and by the time this guy arrives, it's already in the high excitability phase and can ideally amplify the response. In exchange, this guy resets the uh, high frequency side to prepare it for upcoming consonants and so on. So uh, it's still a hypothesis because we, we have some evidence for it, but uh, even for me, it's, we need more. Uh, so we hypothesize, hypothesize that within a syllable, <coughs> that is constructed of a consonant and a vowel, counterphase and change uh, oscillations in the delta theta band across A1 are reset twice. And, and the, the advantage of this mechanism would be that even though speech is a bit irregular, if you can set the pace twice uh, in a cycle, you get much more precise tracking. And, uh, and with that, I would just like to thank the lab uh, who did all the work and my collaborators who gave us all the ideas. And thank you for your attention. <coughs> okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm sure there are many questions, so... Joachim. Thanks, Pika. Very nice talk. So, in the community, we are typically talking about the entrainment of intrinsic brain oscillations, so ongoing brain oscillations from MEG or EG that is very difficult to tell. Yes. That you actually like face aligning and ongoing oscillation. So you're much closer to, to, the, to the neuron. So, I mean, is there hard evidence suggesting or telling us it's really the same oscillation that we are resetting or aligning? In humans? Or in, in monkeys, <laughs> ideally in humans. Or I, I, from your data in monkeys. Oh, oh you mean uh, the, the speech? Uh, reset and entrain the same oscillations are, as are very simplistic stimuli, or sorry, maybe I... Yeah, or, or in general, when, like, you showed many data about entrainment, and then the understanding is usually that's like an entrainment of ongoing intrinsic oscillations. So what is the hard evidence that it is really, like, let's say, an ongoing oscillation at a certain frequency that is phase-aligned? With, with the simplistic stimuli, we, we do not have good evidence for speech, but I... I guess a similar methodology uh, could be applied. So for me, even though in some cases we achieve situations when, where there is very little evoked responses, so there is no chance of artifacts, the, the strongest evidence comes from the 
the entryment after effect. So if you, if you stimulate at a certain frequency and you stop stimulation and look at the frequency of ongoing activity, you just look at a, a spontaneous spectrogram. If there is evidence of your previous stimulation, like for a longer, for a few more cycles, then I don't see any other explanation that you, other than that you entrain those oscillations, and we do have evidence for that. And actually, this methodology can be used, it, it, it could be used to test the question whether you're actually entraining theta or alpha oscillations when you stimulate at 13 hertz or when the speech is speeded up, because <clears throat> we do see that for certain frequencies, this does not work. Like, for some reason, at least in the monkey auditory system, there seems to be a gap around 3 hertz. We have no idea why. <laughs> around 3 hertz, you cannot entrain. There, below it's good, above it's good. And same for alpha. Alpha, we didn't manage to entrain in the auditory system. Yes, Annelies. Um, in the experiment where you use Maria's stimuli, Yes. How can you, maybe I missed something of your explanation, but how can you talk about an oscillation uh, when there is just one repetition, uh, you know, after just one repetition? What, what is it that's going on? You, you mean what happens at the first... So yeah. the ITC obviously has uh, temporal smearing, so what you see likely is that the second repetition mm. resets delta, and then the frequency is actually uh, adjusted. So yes. Why? Uh, what? How? <laughs> I have how no idea. How does it reset? I, mean, I how could it? Reset? I have no idea about the mechanism. Because, because it's very weak. B basically, you know, you resetting. Uh, we talk about resetting with I, a strong input. Exactly. Here. We talk no. No. About resetting with something that comes from I, I think, statistics that uh, Alessandro talked about. I think what happens before. is your brain parses first has to parse this thing because otherwise, how do you know where the beginning and end is? And then, once it's parsed, you somehow amplify the input that signals the beginning. I, uh, okay. I'm puzzled by it, but, but it's amazing that it does it. And uh, one important thing is that these, um, these patterns are completely random in frequency. Mm -hmm. so, so they are just made up of random tones. But yet, the brain always aligns the oscillations to the beginning of the pattern. So not, not at some random point in the pattern. And uh, it's amazing how, how it knows how to do that, yeah. May I inject uh, something, you know, when, I, when Peter told me about that. So the stimulus is 50 millisecond long texture, and then there are 10 such textures, and what he does, he repeats every tenth of them. So you have random texture, random texture, random, random repetition, random, random, random repetition. So I'm suggesting that maybe you have an object, you know, a texture, you know, uh, decoding already, and then you have a sequence of objects, and every 10 of them is repeating, and that's where the delta are locked onto. But, but how can it be pre-segmented if there is no segmentation boundary? I mean, my understanding is that this is completely random. Yes, but based on memory. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, but if it's based on memory, then it cannot be based on what you just suggested. We, we, were, we were trying to think of a bottom-up mechanism like, like that could be explained by the acoustics, but it's impossible because every tone has the same chance to reset. Like, like there, there is no reset memory. The sound or texture is exactly designed to not contain this. Yes. Thing. So I think the only way that I can, I can think of it is that basically each individual blip of this texture is basically doing its own little reset. And then basically what happens in, uh, in the first repeat is that, uh, that the brain detects, oh, there is a, you know, one of those and comes back, right? Uh, so that you have many thetas triggered. I, I was thinking of that. Um, there could be a brain region where this works, but, but because what we find is that when reset occurs, it's the whole A1. Like if it's local little resets, then, then that, that, would be co that, that, that mechanism could work. Okay. And whichever... I'm going to show you in, in visual cortex, we see theta very localized, actually. Okay. So, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a viable option, at least. And, and then you suggest that basically the start is selected by, by the whichever repetition occurs yeah. first, that's winner takes all 
Right. right. Okay. But you just have many theta. Yeah, that's that's one, ex one possible explanation. Like each little blip spawns a theta. That's so no, no. Occurs, I, yeah. You have it. I would still think it doesn't occur in A1 somewhere else and then back project. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Yeah, I want to go back to the uh, dual coding. Okay. Uh, if we, maybe we can look at the slides while we're talking about it. The, a, a bold new theory. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide that where you summarize the, the... Oh, this one. The, yeah, I mean, so uh, how does this work exactly? So, so, how do, so suppose I slow this down, right? So, I mean, everybody's talking about speeding things up, a, a topic which we should return to because it's deeply mystifying and shrouded in uh, confusion. But the, uh, here, if you slow things down, do you also get a dual timing thing or do you get a true timing or a quadrule what? timing? Or do you, because, I mean, is it driven by every edge in the thing? Because syllables have complicated structures. So what, what's actually being dual timed? So uh, dual timing just means within one oscillatory cycle you have two phase resets. So one possibility is that but, you... But why, why two? I mean, why, why not? I mean, if the, you know, one slow cycle, let's say a theta cycle, could have multiple edges if you have a complex syllable. So why not five if you're speaking Serbo-Croatian or Hungarian for that matter? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, it's just, it's just, I mean, it, so, I mean, it needs a little, I mean, I guess I need the motivation to why I should believe that particular simplification that you guys are concocting, because I can come up with five other simplifications that are equally good. Yes, well, if, if all, basically, what you're talking about, if all of them would reset, then you would just speed up the oscillation, right. and that's possible. Uh, we, actually, actually, you might see something like that here. Do you see the... Right the multiple edges, and, and you get actually a faster oscillation. And uh, I always um, emphasize that in our data, and Odette will disagree with me, but from the point of uh, excitability that is uh, aligned to the timing of speech, theta and delta oscillations are very similar. So with simplistic stimuli, if you entrain them, they actually have the same rules. So we see no evidence for functional um, differentiation. So maybe in A1, delta and theta are used uh, exchangingly, and, and when you have slow uh, repetitions, the brain utilizes delta. When you have fast, it, it utilizes theta. I actually have a related question. So you were saying that the um, high frequency event in the spectrogram is triggering the reset to prepare the system for upcoming input, right? That's what you said about For this. upcoming low frequency, yes. Yeah. So what would come up would be a vowel, and the vowel space is much less distinctive in information theoretic terms. Okay. So why should you prepare for the uninformative part of the syllable? The consonant space is much more variable, right? Yeah, but what I'm saying is it's vice versa. So, so basically then the vowel pre pre prepares you for the uh, upcoming consonant. So. Ah, okay, yeah. yes. That yeah, makes, so makes more sense to me. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Do we have more questions? Yes. Sure. Uh, Four minutes. So you know, this goes to to a um, an exchange that uh, Jonas and I had uh, Don't on, leave, on, Jonas. in Frontiers, where Jonas was talking about. Yeah, okay, <laughs> good. I'm glad you came back. So, so Jonas uh, published a, a um, opinion paper where he said, be aware of, uh, of envelopes. Some, what was the title of it? I forgot. <laughs> That's right. So, so, what, so, so if, if you look at speech through the cochlea, and you look at the cochlear output, so the cochlear output has channels, and if you look at what is important to intelligibility, those are the envelopes of the signals, of the narrow band signals going there. And if you look at those envelopes, you have at the low end, up until maybe two kilohertz, energy bumps in the vowel area. That means the, the vocalic nuclei are very prominent. If you look beyond, above, 
th those are the fricatives. You have bumps of fricatives, and that goes very nicely with, with what he's saying. So if, for example, and, and, and in, in, yeah, in yeah. Keith's paper, we actually talked about maybe there is, you know, some integration, you know, what drives a possible theta. So now he, you are talking about two parts, you know, kind of, and two parts are driving, you know, complementary thetas. I mean, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm listening to what you said.